Hey everyone, this is Mecca. Today, we celebrate that this channel has hit 15,000 subscribers. And 16,000. And 17,000. And maybe if I don't hurry up editing this, 18,000. This is just so massive. I remember not so long ago, I had less than 10,000. And I was making celebration videos every thousand, but the counter just went up so quickly, I couldn't keep up. Uh, so I had to stop. It's insane how far it's come. Uh, I just want to take a moment to say that I appreciate every single one of you. I appreciate people giving me shoutouts, I appreciate people liking my tweets, linking my videos. Of course I also love people who like click the like button, leave a nice comment, all that stuff, but what I appreciate the most is the occasional humbling message of people saying that they're a fan. I remember a couple years ago I was watching a video by someone I was and still am a big fan of, and he said something along the lines of, the idea that I actually have fans is just so strange to me, and that's how I feel about it, so thanks a lot. Now, as you can probably tell by the title of this video, the video is going to be a top 15. I usually don't make this kind of video, top 10s or top whatevers just don't really work for me, they almost feel like cop-outs, I think Meng said it the best, he said, uh, here's my opinion, deal with it. Uh, they're kind of easy to make, there's no real rhyme or reason to them, you can just pick any number at any units and make it work. But I like doing different things for these celebration videos, and since it's a 15k special, we're gonna do a top 15. Uh, not just any top 15, but a top 15 best units of all time in Fire Emblem. So basically I'm saying if I were to make a tier list of every single Fire Emblem game, you know, throw every character in the Fire Emblem roster, which 15 units would be at the top? Full transparency, I've done this sort of thing before, all the way back in 2011. I posted the top 30 best characters of all time countdown on Serenus Forest. You should definitely take a look at it if you find it interesting. My opinions since then have changed quite a bit actually, and the rules are also going to be quite a bit different. Speaking of rules, here's the rules and disclaimers. Number one, I'm only including games that I've played and finished, so that means no FE1, no Echoes or any of the Fate series, so you won't find any Camilla on here, but don't worry, I'm sure Fire Emblem Heroes has enough Camilla for all of you. Number two, no grinding. Fire Emblem games are balanced around not having infinite experience. Grinding can make any unit good, so for the purposes of this list, no arenas, no overworld encounters, no Tower of Valny, nothing of the sort. Number three, hardest mode assumed. If a unit performs well on higher difficulties, that says more about them than if they perform well on a lower difficulty, where almost everyone is good. So generally we're gonna assume the hardest mode. Number four, fast play is assumed. If you have infinite turns to work with, you can do almost anything. You can solo if you're with Arden, you can train Nino to 2020 in negative growths, you can beat maps using base level training units, so instead we gotta raise the bar, and we do that by assuming we wanna beat FE games quickly. The faster you go, the more units are put to the test. However, turn saves won't be the only thing taken into consideration. I'm also going to factor in how much easier the game becomes if you use a unit to their full extent. If a unit reduces the tedium of a game by a lot, that's going to get the major bonus points. That can be through excellent fighting, but it could also be because of some kind of really powerful utility. Number 5, last but not least, this is just my opinion, man. This list will be flawed. Making a perfect top 15 is impossible. Just go ahead and drop your top 15 in the comment section right now. I guarantee it will be different from mine, and that's totally fine. Now I'm not just going to give these characters a place in the top 15, but I'm also going to give them an elaborate unit rating. I can only repeat this character is super good in so many ways after all, so... The way it's going to work is that every character is going to be rated and analyzed in four aspects. Availability, combat, relative, and utility. Availability is basically just a rating based on how much they're around. If a unit is around from the start to finish, I'll give them a perfect 10. The more chapters they miss, the lower their rating. However, in games where availability is a little weird and few characters are actually around all game long, I'll be very lenient with this rating. Combat is pretty obvious, if you're good at fighting things, you get a good rating. Relative, not as obvious. It means, how much does this character stand out among their peers? By how much are they the best? If they're only slightly better than everyone else, their relative rating is going to be a bit low. But if they're unique in some useful way, or they're a god in an army of bad units, this rating will shoot through the roof. Utility basically covers things that are useful but not combat. This won't be a 1 to 10 rating like the other three things, but it will just be a list of things that I consider a big factor. Note that the final ranking of these units is not just the sum of these ratings, it's just a guideline for me to show uh, what makes this unit so good. At number 15, I've got Milady from The Binding Blade. 
Milady Joins is an unpromoted Wyvern Rider with amazing personal base stats and really good harp bonuses. Combined, they make for about 38 HP, 16 strength, 15 skill, 13 speed, and 16 defense, which is really high for that point in the game. Her promotion bonus adds another 5 HP and 2 to every other stat. Despite FE6 enemies being super strong and hard to deal with, Lady can often straight up one round them, sometimes even when using iron weaponry. She does have low resistance, but this is a trait she shares with just about every other melee unit in the game. And she also has a weakness to arrows and the Arcalibra Tome, but that can be solved by stealing the Delphi Shield from Narshan during Chapter 16. So with all these traits combined, there is really no reason Milady shouldn't have a perfect 10 for combat. Now being able to reliably one round enemies is very rare in FE6. The only three units that can really match Milady on this front are like Percival, Rutger, and then Marcus during the early game. This is why I'm giving Milady such a high relative score, and why she's on this list at all. She is head and shoulders above the rest of the cast, and out of all these units, she's the only one that can fly. So her relative rating is a straight 10 out of 10. Speaking of which, flying is really useful. FE6 has many enormous maps, and Milady being able to ignore terrain is a huge deal. Flying alone can salvage a character that's otherwise mediocre, but a character that can fly, take hits, and kill enemies like Milady is absolutely invaluable. In practice, this means Milady can go wherever she wants on the map and do whatever you need her to do. Get rid of all the enemies in a certain section, secure a side objective like a village, or maybe drop someone off. Her only real weakness in my opinion is availability. She only joins in chapter 13, which is about halfway through the game. This still gives her enough time to be an absolutely wonderful unit, but it does put her below all the other units on this list because, as good as she is, she's only doing it for half the time the other units are. That's why I'm giving her a 6 out of 10. I do think the combination of flight, high durability, and brutal offense puts her in the top 15 though, since even most good units can only boast one or two of these traits. At number 14, I've got Jill from Radiant Dawn. This one is probably going to be the most controversial, but whatever, I'm ready. So, Jill joins near the end of part 1, and her stats actually look kind of mediocre, especially her 24 HP. If you throw her at enemies with just her raw bases, she's just not going to look all that impressive. But what Jill excels at is using resources better than her fellow Dawn Brigade members. Her stats are just good enough to where a tiny boost can either take an extra hit or two, or dish one out. Part 1 has a Draco Shield, an Energy Drop, and two Seraph Robes that she makes really good use of. She can also make good use of Transfer Bonuses from Path of Radiance, which can boost her base Strength, Defense, and Speed by 2 each. Jill makes such a good user of these resources because she's the only long-term unit in Mikaya's army that can fly. That makes her the most efficient unit by far, to clear out large maps with a lot of terrain like 1-6, 3-6, and 3-12. It will also make her one of your best units in Part 4. Any efficient playthrough of FE10 is built around using Jill to her full potential. This is the reason why I gave her such a huge relative rating of 10. The Dawn Brigade is absolutely dying for a strong flyer. Without her, it takes forever to create these terrain heavy maps. However, I will admit that Jill's combat isn't anywhere near perfect. She's probably the worst at it out of all the combat units on this list. Her availability is also a little wonky, but that just goes for Radiant Dawn in general. It's pretty close to perfect as far as Radiant Dawn units are concerned, but not being there before 1-6 or in 1-8 in general, it hurts a little bit, so giving her just an 8 seems fair. A funny thing about Jill and Radiant Dawn is that she's actually not weak to arrows, but instead she has a weakness to thunder magic. This is a great trade-off for her that other flying classes would love to make, because bow users are a lot more dangerous than thunder mages. While the high damage and the crit rate that Thunder Mages have is a little bit annoying at times, the lack of an arrow weakness is another part of what makes Jill so powerful, especially in part 4. Just like with Milady, the combination of durability, raw power, and flight is hard to beat. Especially when we're now in a game where the objective of a lot of maps is kill a lot of enemies. One thing unique to Jill is that not only is she good in one range combat, but she can also use forged hand axes in part 4 to one round enemies even at 1 to range. A flying unit that one rounds enemies at 1 2 range is basically unseen, even in this very list. There's almost no one in any game who can do that. Now, to be fair, Jill looks a lot stronger on easy mode and normal mode than she does on a hard mode. The benchmarks she needs to reach are lower, and she snowballs a lot quicker due to the large pool of bonus and combat experience, but I said I would put emphasis on hard mode, so I won't take that into account. I still think she's one of the best units no matter what, but if you're not playing for low turn count, it's easy to see why she doesn't look as impressive to most people. You really have to be willing to dedicate a lot to Jill, and that's why I only put her at number 14.
At number 13, I've got Sida from Shadow Dragon. Sida's combat can be described with just her weapon, the Wing Spear. It is by far the best weapon in Shadow Dragon, seemingly tailor-made for it, and she's the only person who can use it. The Wing Spear is a lance with effective damage against mounted and armored enemies, kind of like the Rapier. However, in this game, you can force the Wing Spear to increase its might. For every point of might you put onto the Wing Spear, it gains 3 might against the enemies it's effective against. This allows Sida to one-round KO or even one-hit KO those enemies. And it means that Sida can save uses of the Wing Spear and avoid a counterattack on player face when wrecking these Cavaliers and Armor Knights. Most of the bosses in Shadow Dragon are also weak to the Wing Spear, which makes Sida the best boss killer in the game. Thanks to her speed, which is also the best in the game, she can double and therefore one-round pretty much all of them. The fun doesn't end there though. Just like the previous two units, Sida is a flyer. While Shadow Dragon doesn't have rescuing, she can still use the impassable terrain to protect herself, or fly over it to reach areas before your other units can. Sida is the most flexible unit on your team for quite some time, and this makes it really easy to go in for the kill at just the right moment. At first she rides a Pegasus, but when she promotes, she trades the horse in for a flying dragon, just like the ones Milady and Jill have. As a Pegasus Knight, Sida's strength, HP and defense are all a little bit suspect, but after promotion this problem is basically solved, thanks to her enormous promotion gains. That only leaves her with an arrow weakness, which sadly is a bigger problem for her than it was for the aforementioned Dragon Riders. She can at least shed her wings with the reclass feature though, becoming a paladin with good mobility, or a swordmaster with access to worm slayers and a higher speed cap. But generally you have to be a bit careful where you put Sida, due to her low HP and average defense for a good portion of the game. Because of these slight issues, I can't really give Sida any higher than an 8 for combat. Her relative usefulness is great though, easily the best combat unit in Shadow Dragon. Although there's other units that can fly or make use of effective forges, she's the best combination of them and her availability is a perfect 10. In my opinion, she's a pretty good choice for number 13. At number 12, I've put Safi from Thracia 776. The first thing you'll probably notice about Safi is that I gave her a very low 2 for combat. When she joins in chapter 3, she simply cannot fight, and enemies will instantly capture her if given the chance. She's alright at fighting after she promotes, but the reason why Safi is on this list has nothing to do with combat. It's her amazing staff utility. In Thracia, you obtain your first warp staff at the end of chapter 7, and Safi's gonna be the first one who is able to use it. Warp has infinite range in this game, regardless of the user's magic. So thanks to Safi, whoever you want is getting an insane mobility boost. Thanks to the warp staff, a lot of long, tedious maps in Thracia become very simple and even reliable warp skips. At first it's just a convenience, but as the game goes on, excessive warping becomes almost mandatory to maintain your sanity. Now warp staffs are a bit rare, so the first one you get might end up breaking soon. But you also get a hammer and staff, and for some reason Safi is the only one who can use it. This means you can repair a single warp staff up to 5 uses in a playthrough. Or you can repair your Puji Axe, Puji Axe, or Tina's Thief Staff, or anything you want. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to staff utility in Thracia though. Besides warp, you also have to rescue and rewarp staffs for transportation. There's also status staffs to consider. Safi can cure your other units with the restore staff if they get afflicted, or she can turn the tables on the enemies and silence them or put them to sleep. You need to have higher magic than the enemy to do this to them, but Safi has some of the highest magic in the game, so that's not a problem for her. Just about every stat in Thracia caps at 20, so Safi easily reaches her magic cap. And last but not least, she can also use healing staffs if your other units are low on HP. Careful though, because staffs can miss in Thracia if the wielder has less than 10 skill, which is the case for Safi until she levels up for a bit. Besides combat, Safi has one other Achilles heal, and that's fatigue. Every time a unit in Thracia does anything, such as fighting or using a staff, their fatigue goes up a bit. And once their fatigue is higher than their HP, they have to sit out a chapter to rest up. Using high rank staffs gives quite a bit more fatigue than fighting does, and Safi's HP is pretty low, so Sometimes she's going to have to sit out a chapter. S-Drinks can alleviate this problem though. Safi is your only high rank staff user for a pretty long time. And even when you get others, she will still likely be your best for some time to come. She's the only one who can hammer, and she will have the highest magic until others reach the 20 cap as well. For that reason, I gave her a high relative rating of 9. Her availability isn't perfect, she misses out on like 3 maps at first, and then almost all the Mansa chapters. But she's still around for almost all the game, so I gave her an A. Overall, Safi is easily the most important unit in efficient Thracia playthroughs, greatly reducing its tedium at times. 
She's one of the most broken things about Thracia, and I wouldn't have it any other way. A fitting number 12. At number 11, I've got Silk from Gaiden. And yes, I am using Silk's Echo's artwork for this. Deal with it. Just like Safi, you can tell that Silk is not here for combat. She's actually capable of fighting when you get her, but it's nothing to write home about. Silk is here for her staff utility, or rather, white magic, but white magic is basically the equivalent of staffs in Gaiden. Silk is very similar to Safi. She is also on this list because she can use infinite range warp to let your powerhouses go anywhere you want to break the game. People in Gaiden have pretty low movement, which makes it a drag to get someone like Elm or Lucas to wherever you want them, so using warp to speed things up is pretty damn helpful. Unfortunately, getting warp is pretty tricky. While in Thracia you could just spam staves and then promote to gain A rank of staves, in Gaiden things work a little bit differently, because Gaiden likes to do things its own way, always. In Gaiden, Warp is a spell that Silk can learn. To be precise, she learns at level 7, and she joins at level 1. This would not be an issue if using her healing magic would give her EXP, but it doesn't. Instead, she has to make use of that lackluster combat I mentioned earlier. The only combat spell or black magic that Silk can learn is Resire, also known as Nosferatu. This spell always has a 50% chance to hit, meaning Silk is about as reliable as your average act user in FE6. It does have the HP draining effect, but if you miss it really doesn't do Silk any good. It makes getting EXP on her super annoying, since she doesn't gain any EXP if she doesn't hit the enemy. The best way to augment this problem is to have her use the speed fountains, basically the equivalent of speed wings. With that tiny speed boost, she can at least double most slow enemies and have a higher chance to hit at least once and get both HP and EXP. With that, it's much easier to get her to level 7 and get that juicy juicy warp. Once you do get Warp, it's such a relief. You can clear maps much more easily and quickly in Chapter 1 and in Elves Route forwards. So quickly that you would wish you could do it in Seleka's Route 2, but the sister you get there doesn't learn Warp. Fortunately, what you could do is you can get Silk killed on Elves Route, and then use a Revival Shrine on Seleka's to get her back there. Then you can clear Seleka's maps a lot faster too, and when you're done, well, you just get her killed again. And put it back in Elm Squad. This definitely isn't Morbid at all. At least you could say it gives her some pretty good availability. Though even without this death trick, she's still around for most of the game in Elm's route. Silk has some other utility if you manage to level her really highly. Her best spell is probably Deer, during at level 14, which will eliminate a large number of enemies from the map without fighting at all. This makes random encounters and maps so much quicker, but it's pretty hard to train Silk to level 14. These white magic spells also reduce Silk's HP when used, so if you want to make use of them more often than twice or so per map, you'll have to use Nosferatu or have another healer patch her up. Silk has little to no competition at her niches. The only other potential warper in the game is Tatiana, and she joins very very late, and just like Silk, several levels removed from warp. That's why Silk deserves no less than a 10 for her relative rating. No one does what she does, and it's a highly desired bit of utility. Silk's start is really unfortunate, but it's worth going through the annoying process of getting her to level 7 just to make the rest of Gaiden a lot more fun. Gaiden is not a game many people have played, and there's a lot of good reasons not to just play Gaiden Bro and his remake, but I find Silk and her broken magical spells actually make it pretty entertaining once in a while. Uh, and she's definitely crucial in any kind of efficient playthrough, which is why I've put her here at number 11. At number 10, we've got Lena from Shadow Dragon. Remember all that hard work that Silk and Safi had to do to be able to use Warp? How Silk needs to actually learn the spell and how Safi needs to get the right staff rank? Yeah, Lena's having none of that. She just straight up joins with the Warp staff in her inventory and she can use it. And once more, developers thought it was cool to just give it infinite range like in the original games. Lena can just warp a boss killer or Marth all the way across the map to just finish any map in two turns, or even one turn if you want to. Combined with the power of Forges and a strong boss killer like Sita, you can trivialize over half the game with Lena. Just like Safi, she is also the only person who can use Hammer, although this time you get it much later in the game, in Chapter 20. It doesn't really matter, since there's plenty of warp staffs to go around. You get at least 3 in the regular chapters, and a 4th if you visit Chapter 17x. Since each warp staff has a massive 7 uses, that gives you plenty of warps to start skipping as early as Chapter 11 if you want to. 
With all of that utility in mind, it once again doesn't really matter that her combat is practically non-existent. She doesn't even have to promote in order to use warp, so there's no reason to bother with that. She can use the various healing staves to keep the rest of your squad alive, including an infinite range physics, so that's really nice. What makes all this even more ridiculous is that she joins us early as chapter 3, so her availability rating is once again near perfect. I also gave her a high relative rating of 9, because she's the only warp user you have for quite a while. And even when you get others, such as Boa or Wendell, there's generally multiple warps to be done every chapter, so it doesn't really diminish her in any way. You know, I love Shadow Dragon as a game, so it might seem strange that I'm loving a unit that makes it shorter, but there is no doubt in my mind that Lena's warping shenanigans are a really good way to trivialize Shadow Dragon, and that's why the third of the Warp Sisters is right here, at number 10. At number 9, I've got Marcus, the first of the many Jagan characters on this list. When Marcus joins, he is practically invincible. He kills everything on the map in one round, even bosses with the right weapon. It's impossible to overstate how dominant Marcus is here. He has full control of the weapon triangle, with A rank in swords and lances, as well as B in axes, and he has the luxury of being able to use both javelins and hand axes for 1 2 range. He stays ridiculous until around the mid game, where he can run into some slight doubling issues due to his 20% speed growth, but fe 7 enemies weigh themselves down, so he still doubles most unpromoted enemies. Where I do penalize him a bit is his relative rating, since while he is overall the best at combat in fe 7 it's not that hard to be a combat god in this game. Almost anyone can get to the point of one round KOing at some point, and since there's a lot of survive and defend maps, it's easy to train units without losing turns. You also get several units that are good or better at combat from the get-go, such as Hawkeye, Pence, and Harkin. But that doesn't negate the fact that Marcus is available for almost every chapter in the game, or the fact that he has a lot of uses outside of combat. Thanks to his 8 movement, he can go anywhere you want, fulfill side objectives, intercept threatening enemies, or perform rescue drops. Marcus is as strong, accurate and tanky as it gets early on, and although he becomes more of a mortal later on, he is never a bad unit to deploy. A lot of new players are warned by semi-experienced players that Marcus is a trap, but in reality he's just a really powerful tool that you should make use of whenever you feel like it would help you. I don't recommend you solo entire chapters with him, but there's nothing wrong with using him when he's at his best. He's not the strongest Jagan in the series, but he's ridiculous enough to be up here at number 9. Speaking of Jagans, at number 8 we've got Titania. Titania has a lot of the same advantages that Marcus has. She's a paladin that joins as early as possible, which gives her a good availability score, and because she's a pre-promote, she has a huge statistical advantage over her fellow grill mercenaries for quite some time. While she cannot use swords, she can use both lances and axes, once again giving her access to those crucial hand axes and javelins to clear up entire sections of a map pretty fast. And just like Marcus, she has access to a horse that lets her make full use of her high movement. Titania's horse is just a bit better though, since hers also lets her move after attacking, rather than just trades and rescue drops. In fact, you can tell that the Tellius developers really like Titania quite a lot. While Marcus's growths weren't all that good and he's carried mostly by his bases, Titania has both good bases and good growths. 45% strength, 60% skill and 50% speed are all really high, especially since you can use the Night Ward to increase that speed growth to 80% whenever you want. It's just so strange that Titania would already be good without all these extra boosts to Paladin and Zetelius, but now she's just insane. Just like in FE7 though, it is fairly easy for Titania's peers to catch up to her, and even surpass her at some point in the game. You do get access to a lot of bonus experience after all, even on the hardest difficulty in the English release of Path of Radiance. So even though Titania is relatively good for the first half of the game, I couldn't give her a 10 for relative, simply because most people are at least her equal for the latter half. Speaking of bonus experience though, that is a really interesting incentive to actually make use of Titania early on, since she helps you fulfill the turn requirements to get the maximum amount. Titania is so close to being a perfect unit in FE9, it really makes you wonder why she's only at number 8. But like I said, competition in this list is super tight, and FE9 happens to have a lot of other units that are just as broken as Titania for a huge part of the game. That, and she lacks wings, unlike our next contender. At number 7 we've got Har from Radiant Dawn. If there is anything that the Fire Emblem fandom at large will ever agree on, it's that Har is a god in Radiant Dawn. 
despite having only one functioning eye, he still destroys everything in his sight, and you'd actually have to try to get the guy killed. From the moment he joins, Har is a flying tank. With 46 HP and 23 defense, he shrugs off anything physical. Even bows, because his class is not weak to them in Radiant Dawn. All of this would be fancy on its own, but Har doesn't just take hits well, he also dishes them out. He has a massive 23 base strength and a raw power of access behind him, so he too kills even enemy generals. Or better, if you give him the hammer. That's not to say that Har's combat is without its flaws, but these flaws are so easy to fix, I really can't give him any less than a 10 anyway. He's weak to Thunder Mages and he has low resistance, but Pure Water is there to help you with that. So is Nullify to negate the weakness entirely. His 20 speed is a little bit shaky, but Part 2 has a speed wing you can give to him, which combined with his plus 2 promotion bonus lets him double just about everything in Part 3 anyway. He's also a good user of bonus experience, since the 3 stats most likely to level up for him are Strength, Skill and Defense. Once those 3 have capped, he is fairly likely to gain speed, since bonus experience will always give you exactly 3 stats. Even if Har isn't double attacking though, his huge mobility lets him take care of enemies inside objectives before anyone else. He is the only flyer on the Grill Mercenaries for half of part 3, and even when others join, there is always something to do for every one of them. When Har gets to 3rd tier, his capacity lets him make use of great skill combos such as Celerity and Savior, to quickly get Ike to a seize point. But he can also go with Pass to sneak by enemies and get to side objectives much more quickly. That said, Har doesn't have perfect tens across the board. A bit of a penalty in availability is obvious. He's around in part 2 and part 3, but he misses out on a couple chapters each. Still, he's more available than almost any unit in Radiant Dawn barring Iliana, so I don't want to give him any lower than an 8. The reason his relative rating is only a 9 is because he is in an army with fairly powerful allies, such as Ike, Mia and Titania, so he doesn't stand out as much. But he still holds his own compared to them, and he's the only one that can fly. Overall, Har is a strong unit in a strong team. But the fact that he is so noticeably powerful in a team like the Grill Mercenaries puts him at a solid number 7. At number 6, I've got Selif from Genealogy of the Holy War. Selif inherits just about everything from his father his weapons, his items, his growths, his holy blood, and of course the ever important pursuit skill. Without his inheritance, Selif is just an above average lord. But with a proper inheritance setup, he's the most important and most powerful character in the second generation of Fire Emblem 4. With just pursuit and a strong weapon from his dad, Sadov can already one round kill enemies in chapter 6. That strong weapon could be the Hero Sword, which will let him quadruple everything he faces, but a lot of players have him inherit the Silver Sword instead, which Sigurd receives from Arvis in the prologue. Or you might have him use the Light Brand for some 1 2 range. Regardless, it will likely have over 50 kills built into it which means Selef can also critical the few enemies he cannot one round. Now, just being able to inherit powerful items doesn't make a character good, almost anyone can do that. But if you're playing FE4 efficiently, then Selef being good is the most important thing to clear chapters quickly. The speed at which Selef can clear enemies, kill bosses and seize thrones is the speed at which you'll be able to complete the game. Every turn that Selef has slowed down makes FE4 drag on longer, so it's in your best interest to make Selef as powerful as you can, as quickly as you can. That's why in efficient playthroughs, Selef has given some really strong tools to work with. The most important items you should get are the Leg Ring and a Paragon Ring. The purpose of the Leg Ring is obvious. The sooner he gets to a castle, the quicker he can seize it. The Paragon Ring is good, because the one thing Selef did not inherit from Sigurd is his base class. While Sigurd starts as a pre promoted mounted unit called Lord Knight with amazing stats across the board, Selef starts as a Junior Lord, with stats roughly around the level of someone like Eliwood. Like I described before, his offense is still fine, but his movement and durability really suffer. So fast players generally have set of solo pretty much all of chapter 6, gathering so much experience that he's able to promote at the start of chapter 7. Once Selef is a Lord Knight, like his dad, he's just as powerful if not more so. He surpasses even Oifi, the supposed Jagan of this generation. Thanks to the amazing growths, he's going to have almost 60 HP, 19 to 20 defense and even a decent 13 resistance. Offensively, he's no slouch either, with a capped 25 strength and 17 to 18 speed. With the right weapon, he can reliably kill any boss he comes near. From here on out until the end of the game, Selef is and will remain your best unit. Now I know what you might say, he's only up there because he's given every tool in the book, and every drop of EXP from chapter 6. Almost anyone could be good if you give him all that. 
but like I said, I'm assuming a fast playthrough, and setup is your fast playthrough. You'll notice in the utility I listed seizing. The moment setup seizes a castle, all enemies from the castle will vanish, and you can progress through the map. So the better your setup is at getting to that castle, the faster you can play. Try going through generation 2 without training setup, it's super slow, not to mention tedious. When given all this treatment, setup obviously can't be any lower than a 10 for combat. As for availability, I'm counting Selef as fully available since he's there for an entire generation, not missing a single turn. Just like with FE10, availability is a little weird in this game, and there's only one person who's around for longer than that, and that's Finn. So instead I'm counting each generation as a game of its own, and giving Selef a perfect score here too. Of course, some people are just not interested in playing fast, and they might just want to play chapter 6 like any other chapter, splitting the kills with your other units. Zedef will still be a good unit for these players, but perhaps not the best by such a huge margin. Other than stats, he's got some other perks too. He has 3 leadership stars, which will give him and anyone near him 20% hit and avoid. And he gets the turfing right before the end of chapter 10, which is one of the best weapons for taking on the remaining bosses. It has a massive 30 might and it grants 10 skill, speed and resistance. The skill is good for hitting some of these dodgy enemies, while the resistance is important against the many magic based ones. As great as Selev is, I did only give him a 9 for relative to show that others could match his combat potential when given these resources as well. FV4 is full of really strong units, and some of them have an even better start than he does. But they can't match or compensate for Selev's utility in an efficient playthrough, and that's why I've got him here at number 6. Man, number 5, we're really getting into the cream of the crop now. Kicking off the top 5 is Pala, from Fire Emblem, New Mystery of the Emblem and Heroes of whatever this name is way too long. Pala joins us at Pegasus Knight in Chapter 3, making her availability only a little short of being perfect. Usually Pegasus Knights start out weak, but not Pala. She has a B rank in Axis, letting her use the Silver Lance right off the bat. Her stats are nothing to shake a stick at either. Depending on the difficulty and enemy type, she can actually take a hit, perhaps even multiple, and come out on top. She's also lightning fast at 16 speed, probably the highest speed on your team right now. Her growth might not be impressive, but it hardly matters when your base is this high. Just like Sida, Pala has access to the ridiculous Draco Knight promotion, letting her use axes and getting those enormous stat bonuses to make her even stronger and tankier. Pala also makes really good use of the reclass feature. In FE12, you can access the Cavalier class line without even promoting, meaning Pala can always temporarily ditch her wings if there's too many archers around. Swordmaster and Sniper are also viable options in certain situations, thanks to their high base weapon ranks and high speed. At this point, I think it's fair to say her combat is as good as it gets in FE12, a 10 out of 10. Unfortunately for her, this game has no rescue dropping, but the option of flying still makes her very flexible. She can use the terrain either offensively to get the jump on enemies, or defensively to limit the amount that can face her, and of course she can zip across the map to any places you might need help in. Even for more casual playthroughs, there is no denying the power of Pala. I wish I had more to say about her, but I don't. I haven't really played FE12 at a high level, just watched a couple of playthroughs of it, but from what I can see, I just know she's super amazing. She's almost impossible to use wrong, unless you fly her straight into an archer squad. There's really only one unit that can compete with her, and that's... Chris, also known as the Avatar from FE12. FE12 went full power fantasy here. Chris is the best unit in the game, but it's really hard to talk about how good he is, because his bases, growths and class are all variable. However, regardless of your choices, they're always going to be good. The most common builds people go with, depending on the difficulty, seem to be Armor Knight, Fighter and Cavalier. Armor Knight gives him enough defense to tank even the strongest enemies, Fighter will let him one round enemies sooner than anyone else on your army, and Cavalier gives him the most mobility and flexibility. Which one you choose depends on what kind of unit you want him to be, and what weapon ranks you want to prioritize building. After promoting, Draco Knight is once again a really common choice, because of its strong stats and flyer utility. If you've been in the game at least once, you can even start out as a fighter and then become a Draco Knight after promoting, letting you retain your axe rank. The options don't end there of course, I've seen successful builds of just about any type of my unit, including magical ones. It really just depends on your preferences, and what you think you'll need. And of course, the most important aspect that we can't forget is the customization of Chris. You can use eye patches, hat bands, ridiculous hats, and of course, he's going plain bald. They're all options for him. I look awful! <laughs> I'm gonna switch back, I think. 
As great as the Avatar is, he's really difficult to discuss in depth because he can be so many different things. Like I said earlier, FE12 is not a game I am the most familiar with, but I do know enough to see that Chris and Pala are both crucial pieces. The bottom line is that Chris is really strong, flexible, and he can do whatever you want him to. I can't really give him any lower than a perfect score across the board. He's available in every chapter, and he's virtually guaranteed to be the best unit you have in every chapter, unless you purposely gimp him. If there's one thing that's holding him back, is that despite all of his strength, he still needs a lot of help to beat the higher difficulties of FE12, since his enemies are just so damn powerful, but as you can tell by his number 4 spot, I don't really hold that against him. Alright, we're at number 3 of the best 3 units in the entire franchise. Now, from here on out the units we're discussing are basically flawless, and which ones of these 3 are the best really just depends on your criteria and what you value more. Personally, I went for the units that I felt made the greatest difference in their respective games, which one would be missed the most if left out. And with that in mind, at number 3, I've placed Seth from the Sacred Stones. Seth is as perfect as an early game paladin can be. Just like Marcus in Titania, he curb stomps the entire game without breaking a sweat, often by just using iron weapons or javelins. But if there's anything he can't one round easily, he can just bust out a silver lance or an effective weapon. Just like Titania, Seth is also blessed with high growths. In fact, he is some of the best in the entire game. So even though his bases are quote unquote low for his level, he remains your most powerful unit for the whole campaign. Of course, just like many mounted units discussed before, Seth can also be helpful by ferrying people or storming ahead to save a village in peril. You can do this more safely than almost anyone else because of his awesome stats, which can sometimes make him better for this purpose than flyers. Seth's weapon ranks are as high as you'd expect, with an A in both swords and lances. Unfortunately for him, the Paladins lost access in the transition from FE7 to FE8, but that was probably for the sake of balance. Too bad Paladin is still broken class. Seriously, I can't emphasize enough how Seth is just a huge murder machine, there isn't a single flaw to his stats. He doubles reliably, he 2 with kills almost any enemy type, he's too bulky to take down physically or magically, and he's accurate. Like I said about Chris, the ratings at this point are basically for show. Seth is better than anyone at anything. The only thing that holds Seth back in some maps is his lack of wings. That means that occasionally flyers like Vanessa and Cormag, or even warp users like Archer, can outdo him. This is a very minor point since Seth will still be instrumental in completing these maps even with the help of these other units, but when you're this high up on the list of the top 15 list of best units of all time, a tiny little flaw like this can hurt you. But I don't think there's any shame in the number 3 spot. Alright, number 2. There's only a couple of candidates who could possibly fill these spots. In fact, I'm sure you've guessed them already, especially considering Seleth was in here. That's right, at number 2 I put Sigurd. Sigurd is your lord of the first generation in FE4, but at the same time you could say he's his own Jaken. He starts out as a pre-promoted lord knight, and because of that he has a massive 9 movement. As you'd expect out of a unit that ended up above Seth, his stats are just as busted, if not more so. He's one of the only characters who reliably one rounds FE4 Gen 1 enemies, and those guys have lots and lots of HP. His base speed of 12 doubles just about everything, because he's a sword user, and swords in FE4 don't weigh anything, especially not compared to the heavy lances and axes that a lot of enemies use. But even enemy sword and magic users will likely get doubled by Sigurd. His 30% speed growth might seem a bit low, but it doesn't actually hurt him at all. He has a stupidly high 110% HP growth, as well as a monstrous 50% strength, 50% skill and 40% defense, on top of his already good bases. You can see just how strong Sigurd is from turn 1, where he one rounds a bandit your other characters need multiple rounds for. Sigurd is also mounted, which is of paramount importance in FE4 with its enormous maps. He has at least 9 movements, though when he's walking on road tiles, he might even be able to move 12 tiles in a single turn. FE4 also has the most broken version of Kanto in this series. Not only can Sigurd use up his remaining movement after attacking, he can also equip a different weapon. Sigurd only has one skill, but it's the best one. Pursuit, a skill that lets you double attack if you have the speed advantage. It's a given in most Fire Emblem games that your character is able to do this, but not in this game. In fact, Sigurd is one of the few mounted units with Pursuit in the first generation, and he's by far the strongest one. Sigurd also obtains a Silver Sword at the end of the prologue, and he's easily the best user of it. I mean, you wouldn't give it to Ethlin, would you? During Generation 1, 
You can spend time getting kills into either that thing or perhaps another broken sword, like the hero sword or the light sword, so that he and Selef can score some critical hits. The light sword is nice because other than magic swords, Sigurd's only option for one to range is using a javelin, and those kinda suck with their 18 weights. Incredibly enough, Sigurd is so good that he can steal one round so many with the help of the javelin. As the Lord, the most powerful items in FE4 basically fall into Sigurd's lap. He's your strongest character, and because of that, he's also your best boss killer. When Sigurd kills the boss, he can seize the castle on the same turn, making the rest of the enemy army vanish, so doing it with him is optimal. This gives him easy access to rings dropped by bosses such as Magic Ring, Barrier Ring, and Shield Ring. He can keep them to dominate the game even harder and pass them on to Selif, or he can sell them to become super rich and afford auto toys. Sigurd on his own basically determines how fast you can go through FE4. Just like with Selif, it's in your best interest to give him as many tools as possible to break the game in half. Stat rings, leg ring, powerful weapons, that kind of stuff, but even if you're taking your time, and FE4 really loves people who can take their time, it's easy to see why Sigurd is the second most broken unit of all time. Now, I put Sigurd at second place here, but if you take a look at that Serenus Force top 30 I made, you would see that Sigurd was actually the number one there. That means that number one is a newcomer, right? Why, yes it is! At number one, I put none other than Robin, the avatar from Fire Emblem Awakening. Just like Chris, Robin's stats and class are variable. However, he, or she, always starts off as a tactician, a user of swords and tomes with similar stats. Honestly, when I first got mine, I wasn't very impressed, but then again, when I first played Awakening, I didn't understand pair up. I thought I, it couldn't possibly be as broken as it seemed to be. When I realized what it did, oh boy. Pair up with Robin is extremely broken because they have the veteran skill. This lets them gain 50% more XP than normal when they're paired up. The skill is absolutely insane and makes Robin snowball like no other unit. It doesn't hurt that Robin has some absurd growth rates. Without any modifications from their boon, bane or class changing, all the important ones are 50% or higher. Robin also makes great use of Awakening's reclass feature. While most units only have a couple of options to reclass into, Robin can turn into just about any class you want him or her to be. This gives him access to all sorts of weapon types and skills tied to these classes. A lot of people have looked into min-maxing Robin more than I have, so I'm not the authority here, but I do know, for example, about the destructive power of the combination of Vantage and Vengeance, which lets Robin deal critical hit damage before the enemy even gets to attack. If you have a female Robin, you can reclass her into Pegasus Knight and then promote into Dark Flyer. This is a flying class with access to magic and one of the most broken skills in the history of Fire Emblem, Gill Force. Gill Force lets a character move again after they kill an enemy unit, only once per turn, but that's still insane. If you manage to get your Dark Flyer Robin to level 15, this skill will let you zip through maps with absolute ease. But really, there's as many different viable builds as there's different Robins. Even if you just leave him as a Tactician or a Grandmaster, they still kick all kinds of butt. One of the more broken things about Second Ceiling is that it also resets a character's level to 1. Their level before reclassing is factored in, but generally a Second Sealed character gains levels at a highly accelerated rate, and Robin's XP gain was bonkers to begin with. The main reason I have Robin at number 1 is that they don't just dominate the game, but they dominate it with ease, even in the most ridiculous modes, Lunatic and Lunatic Plus. With the right build, they can actually solo these, and it's actually one of the easiest ways to beat these modes. So a strategy I like to use to trivialize Awakening is the water trick. What you do is you pair Lissa and Frederick as vanguards to Robin and Krom, and you have them walk on water, because they're the only ones who can. The enemies cannot, and there's only a couple of ranged enemies, so you're free to pick off all the enemies at your leisure with Robin and get him a bunch of EXP thanks to Veteran. And with all the EXP from this map, Robin is set to dominate the rest of the game, perhaps with a little bit of help from Frederick. Normally, soloing a game would be made a bit harder by having to keep other units safe, but you can simply undeploy everyone else and then pair up Krom to Robin to keep him safe. Doing this will even give Robin a sizable stat boost, not to mention a proposal if you're using female Robin. Just like with FE12, I don't have as much experience with this game as most of you probably do. I can't lie, Awakening is by no means my favorite game, and I'm not a huge fan of the whole power fantasy, self-insert pandering that units like Chris and Robin are going for. But when I'm analyzing and comparing unit strengths, I just can't leave these units out. They are so, so powerful. I'm sure Corrin would be up here too if I had any experience playing Fates. Robin is the most ridiculous unit because he truly is flawless, and he can carry your butt all the way to the finish line even in an unfair mode like Lunatic. While Seth and Sigurd are basically perfect at combat, you miss them less than you would miss Robin in Awakening, especially on the higher difficulties. The fact that FE4 and FE8 are generally easier than Awakening doesn't really matter at all here. It's how much better Robin is than the rest of the cast that makes him shine through. 
Magic gives them perpetual 1 to range. They have access to every skill, every class, their growths are through the roof, and they gain XP faster than anyone else. Honestly, when writing this, I kept writing he because my first Robin was male, but female Robin is actually better if you're going with the so-called Crobin solo because she can go up to S support with Crom. Meanwhile, male Robin can only go up to A support, but male Robin is still better than anyone else in Awakening, and indeed, any unit ever made. And with that, we've reached the end of it. Game-breaking, powerful, ridiculous, insane, trivializing, I've used like all these adjectives to describe the characters on the list, and now I'm out of all of them. As far as I'm concerned, these are the 15 best units in the games that I have played. There are some more that I would have loved to include, but this video is quite lengthy already, so instead we're gonna call it a day. If you're missing someone, or you disagree with my placings, feel free to leave a comment, and maybe I'll make a follow-up video with the honorable mentions. So one last time, thank you for sticking with me, I hope you had a good time. And if you want, please recruit the like button by turning it blue, and hopefully I'll see you again. Bye.